All right, we are getting ready to get started here tonight. So we're getting some people tuning in, Dave. It's going to be great. All right, so hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight to our virtual Star Watch program. We have a great program lined up for tonight. Um, but before we get the real party going, I just have a few announcements to go over. And just so everyone knows, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to add them into the comment section, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, and we will answer them as soon as we can uh, during the program. So I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Jennifer Wick, and I am the Public Program Specialist with the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, and I'm based out of the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, which is located at Homer Lake Forest Preserve in Homer, Illinois, which is just about 15 miles uh, east of Champaign-Urbana. And the Interpretive Center is currently open to the public. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m., and we are following current public health guidelines. So you can visit our Facebook page and our website for up-to-date information on what we are doing to keep everyone safe there. Now, Homer Lake Forest Preserve is just one of seven forest preserves in the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. One of those also being Middle Fork River Forest Preserve, which we're gonna talk a little bit about more tonight because it is our dark sky park. Now, if you didn't know this, Middle Fork River Forest Preserve is the only dark sky park in Illinois, and it's been designated as such by the International Dark Sky Association, which makes it the best place to view the stars in Illinois, just hands down. So if you haven't visited any of those preserves, head over to our website for more information on our current open hours and all of our locations and all of that um, information. And you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date with what's happening. So before we get to tonight's program, I would like to mention one upcoming program that we have coming up that this group might be interested in, and it is an in-person program. So we are so excited to be able to start doing in-person outdoor programs again, and we have one coming up on August 11th. It's for the night owls and it is going to be at Middle Fork River Forest Preserve and it is going to be a Perseid viewing event. So if you don't know what that is, we're going to talk a little bit more about that today probably, but it's a meteor shower that will be happening and we will be there at Middle Fork River Forest Preserve at 8.30 p.m. with a sky talk and we will also be there observing the shower probably not until the middle of the night, but at least for the beginning of the night. And you can check our Facebook page for more information about that. Now for tonight's program, we're so excited to be here with Dave Leak. He's a great friend of the Forest Preserve District and you might recognize him or his voice. Uh, he is the former director of the planetarium at Parkland College. So you might recognize that voice from one of those Prairie Stories programs, Prairie Skies, not Prairie Stories. Uh, or maybe you've heard him on the news or on the radio. Uh, but tonight, Dave is going to tell us more about what interesting things we can look for in the night sky during this time of year and specifically from our area here in Champaign County. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Dave. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, I really appreciate that. Thank you for giving up some of your time on a Thursday night and, uh, and thank all of you for taking some time and tuning in. Um, as she said, uh, my name is Dave. If some of you, at least if you're from the area, might uh, have visited the Starkle Planetarium. I worked there for 30 years, went by pretty quickly, and uh, and retired in 2019. And believe it or not, I'm now doing some radio work. So uh, everybody said I had a face for radio. I'm not quite sure what that means. But um, I'm working for WDWS and, uh, and WKIO. So in fact, shameless plug, um, I'm, I'm sort of the, the sub. I'm the utility infielder, which means I'm not good enough to start, but I can fill in at a number of different spots. So uh, I'll be on from six to midnight on WKIO all this weekend. So uh, starting tomorrow night. So you can tune that in if you want to. So um, 
but I'm still doing a little astronomy. I can't ever really get away from it. Uh, we really should be doing this talk out at the Middle Fork River Forest Preserve because that's what we usually do. And obviously there's been some issues over the last, what, 16 months or so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which kind of yeah. kind of keep us from doing something like that. But uh, normally we want to actually be out under the real sky with our telescopes. Um, I'm part of the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society and uh, we've been for many years setting up telescopes out at the Middle Fork. And we hope to be doing that again real soon. Um, right now we're looking at maybe doing something on October the 2nd. So uh, stay tuned for that. Of course, it'll be weather permitting. But as Jennifer said, we have the first and only dark sky park uh, in uh, the state of Illinois right here in Champaign County. So we're very, very fortunate to have that. And I also want to give a little plug if I can to uh, this gentleman, this is Mr. Matt Kuntz, who's the site superintendent at the Middle Fork, and he's standing just to the side there. It looks like that light fixture is really, really small. Either that or Matt's really, really big. Uh, Matt is really, really big, but uh, the light fixture uh, is a little bit in the distance. They built these light fixtures, and, uh, and, and that's how we got the Dark Sky Park designation. And I want to congratulate Matt, even though he's not here, uh, that, or I don't think he is anyway, um, last night, he collected one of five Tourism Impact Awards. And so very, very proud of him. He was there to, uh, to pick up the award. Looked pretty good in a sport jacket, too. So um, congratulations to Matt. So here's what we're going to do tonight. Um, even though we're, we're looking at our computer screens, um, we're still going to take a look at the sky. And, and I want to tell you about some of the things that you can actually go out and find all by yourself. In fact, we encourage you to do that. So for the sake of our sky, we're going to take you to the opposite end of the county, southwest of Champaign. This is our uh, Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society Observatory. Uh, we are going to have our very first face-to-face -face open house. Again, it's weather permitting on September 11th, starting at dusk. I believe that's a Saturday night. So, um, and you don't need to sign up. You don't need anything like that. You can just uh, come out and that, what looks like a shed there in the middle, the roof actually rolls off on those rails you see to the left. And, uh, and we can, we've got a few telescopes inside. So we're anxious to uh, resume our viewing sessions. And when I, when I usually do these talks at the Middle Fork, one of the things I like to do is is start out with how to read a star chart. Now, this is usually interactive. I hand out star charts to you. Obviously, it's tough to do that right now. But um, on the Planetarium website, which is parkland.edu slash planetarium, uh, you can go to resources, and they've got these free charts. If you happen to be part of a scouting group, maybe you're a scout leader, these are copyright free. You can print as many of these as you want, and we have them for each season. So uh, I don't know how easy uh, this is for all of you to see, but I'll do a little orientation. First of all, the big circle that you see there uh, is the horizon. So that's where the sky seems to meet the ground. Now the spot right smack dab in the middle of the circle is gonna be the point straight up. So if you think about taking this chart and kind of jamming it into a, into a cereal bowl, then the sky almost seems bowl shaped over our heads. Now I got a strange word there. Uh, astronomers don't like to say point straight up, so they call that the zenith. They put the name on a TV set too. So um, when you're looking at the zenith, you're looking straight up. So anything on the chart that's near the middle of that circle is gonna be pretty close to straight up in the sky. And then of course you can see at the top, we've got north, at the bottom, we've got south, and then things get a little strange because east and west seem like they're reversed. So, you know, you kind of go left on a map, and that's California, right? Uh, that should be to the west, and that always kind of confuses people. The answer, though, is that it's a star chart. You're meant to hold this chart above your head. So if you take that chart and hold it above your head this way, you can get all the directions to match up. Now, instead of holding this chart over your head and, and trying to look at the entire sky, the first thing you're going to discover, especially if you're near my age, is the back's gonna start hurting. So don't look for the whole sky, just pick a direction and whatever direction you pick, put that, put that uh, uh, part of the chart closest to the ground. 
So if you can see this chart, then uh, right there in the south should be a constellation called Sagittarius. Over in the west, there is the constellation of Virgo. Constellations are in capital letters. And the star Spica is getting ready to set. Over in the east is the great square of Pegasus. And of course, if you turn the chart to where uh, east is at the bottom, it's going to look like a diamond that's that's rising. So we're going to kind of go through this chart and uh, and show you some of the things that you can actually go out and find all by yourself. So let's go ahead and let the sun set. And so if we were out at the observatory here, we'd be seeing the sun setting. And if you look very carefully there to the left of the sun, there's a W. Uh, we're all taught that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And for the most part, that's kind of true. But I know in the summer, the sun really sets uh, pretty much in the, in the northwest. But we're past the first day of summer now. So the sunsets are creeping a little bit closer to the west. So you, you can kind of keep an eye on that. Don't look at the sun, of course, but you can look at where the sun sets. And... Uh, it will be here in the latter part of September when you'll see the sun setting right behind uh, right behind that W. So after the sun sets, I hope you've seen this already, there's going to be a really bright dot over there in the sky. Notice how it's just about due west. And isn't it nice how nature labels things for us? <laughs> if only we're that way in the real sky, right? You've got, you've got uh, the planet Venus there. It's going to look like an airplane coming in for a landing. In fact, not to tell on anybody, but uh, I haven't talked to him in many years, but I had a friend who ran the control tower out at Willard Airport. And it seemed like when Venus was in the sky, there was always one or two pilots each time that would say, you know, we'll let that other traffic land and I'll, I'll go around once. And it's like, dude, the traffic ain't landed. <laughs> that planet's going to stay fairly far away. So Venus is setting about 90 minutes after sunset now. And what's interesting, as we see Venus this time around, is uh, for the next couple of months, it's not going to really seem to get any higher or lower, but it's going to move a little bit from uh, right to left along the horizon. So notice how it's kind of setting due west now, or not, or at least that's where it is right now. You're going to kind of see that drift a little bit to the left. So, uh, so again, it's, it's kind of fun. to You can actually see the sky does change. And if you look carefully, though, you can see the planet Mars. And if you look very carefully, there's a little dot right below it. By the way, this is for the sky tonight. So this is what you can see tonight. That little dot below it is the heart of Leo the Lion. It's a star called Regulus. And uh, if you don't see it tonight, and we got a few clouds over there, but uh, keep watching and you'll see as each night Mars goes a little bit, a little bit farther away from Regulus. We're not going to talk much about Mars tonight, even though we have a, a wonderful spacecraft and a helicopter that is operating on Mars because it's uh, getting ready to pass behind the sun from our point of view. It's going to make it very, very difficult to see. And it's clear across the other side of the solar system, too. Well, let's get back to Venus. Venus is an inner planet, which means that uh, obviously it has an orbit that's smaller and the Earth is outside the orbit of Venus. And uh, so Venus goes around the sun faster. But if uh, Venus is at that point in, in its orbit, you're looking kind of in the direction of the sun. That's bad. Never want to do that. Uh, but you want to catch Venus when it is farthest from the sun, the farthest separation from the sun. Uh, in astrolingo, we call that an elongation. That's not coming up for a few months, but, uh, but we... We want to catch Venus when it is farthest. Now, that angle that those two arrows make right there for Venus is about 48 degrees. Okay, well, big deal. What does that mean? Well, if you take a fist, you can all do this. Just again, don't do this while you're driving. If you take a fist and hold it out as far as you can, there we go, and maybe close one eye and sight right along that and hold that up to the sky, it's about 10 degrees. So think about Venus, if you know where the sun is, at its maximum, will be about five fists away. Now that's at its maximum. Not that it's always that, but that's at its uh, very, ma uh, very maximum. So if you think about what this would look like from the Earth, 
Okay, put your eyes on that earth and now you're kind of looking at the orbit on its edge and here's what it will look like in the sky. Now, the line running clear across the screen, that's the orbit of Mars, but look at the orbit of Venus. See, Venus is coming out from behind the sun. It's going to reach that, that farthest point. That's the elongation point. If uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's that elongation point right there. And then it's going to head back and go between the sun and the earth. So you can kind of imagine that when you look uh, up there in the sky. Now, if you got a telescope, Venus looks pretty cool. Now, first of all, you won't see this kind of detail on Venus. This has kind of been added in. And, uh, but Venus is very reflective. In fact, about three quarters of the light that Venus gets from the sun gets reflected back into space. And that's the light that you and I see. It makes Venus very, very bright. In fact, next to the sun and the moon, Venus is the next brightest thing that you can see in the sky. So, um, but the, the phase here is accurate. So uh, Venus goes through phases a lot like our moon. So you can see a crescent Venus and, and uh, a half lit Venus. And this is what we might call a gibbous phase. So it's greater than half lit. So this is what you might see if you look through a telescope. Now let's take our attention and go from the west. And let's look more in the southeast. And here we're out at our observatory. And you can see right along the horizon, the planet Saturn is there. And Saturn is coming up pretty close to sunset. It's about nine times um, farther away from the sun than our Earth is. And something somewhat special is coming up for Saturn here in just a couple of days. Um, and forgive me, forgive the diagram. But uh, here you see the sun in the middle. Here's the planet Earth. Saturn is an outer planet. And so Saturn orbits out here. Now, if our Earth stays here and Saturn's over here, that's bad because you got to look through the sun to see it. Don't try that. It doesn't work. The best time to see Saturn or any of the outer planets is when it's on the same side of the sun as the Earth. So think about it this way. If you could look at those little arrows, if the sun is in that direction, the planet is opposite. That's where the word opposition comes from. So opposition just means it's opposite the sun. And that's the best time to see an outer planet. Because just look at the separation between the Earth and that red, uh, that red outer planet. Um, that's when the separation is the smallest. So the planet is close, which means it's going to look bright in our sky. If you've got a telescope, it's going to look really big. You're going to be able to see a lot more detail. And with it being opposite the sun, think about it this way. If the sun is setting over there, the planet's rising. So the planet rises at sunset and it's up, it's visible all night. Opposition for Saturn is August the 2nd. So it's coming up. Now that doesn't mean you got to go look at Saturn on August the 2nd. Anytime several weeks before or after that is fine. But that's when it's actually going to be closest. And you can see the rings of Saturn with a small telescope. You can't see it with binoculars, unless you get some really big binoculars. But you uh, you can see the rings with a uh, just with a telescope. And you might, I don't see it in this view, but um, of all of Saturn's moons, did you know Saturn, I think it has 83 moons now. Isn't that amazing? But um, one of them is large enough and bright enough that uh, you can see it even in a small telescope, and it's called Titan. Now, if you wait a little bit, remember Saturn's coming up right about sunset. Wait about an hour, and Jupiter will rise. So Jupiter and Saturn are uh, they're somewhat together. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but it was last December, Saturn, and of course, we had the pandemic we were dealing with, so we couldn't really do a lot of viewing sessions. Saturn and Jupiter were extremely close. Now, Saturn's farther away, but uh, they look like they were next to each other. Well, Jupiter's closer to the sun, so it's orbiting a little faster, and so now they've separated, and you can see how far they've separated since since uh, last December. Opposition for Jupiter is August the 19th. So that's that's when it will be close to us. Now, Jupiter through a telescope is wonderful to see, even a small telescope. Instead of a point-like dot, like a star, you can actually see a disk, and you can maybe see a couple of cloud bands. 
going across. Sometimes you can see two kind of reddish ones. And then you've got the moons. Uh, Jupiter has about 80 moons now. And in fact, uh, they just discovered one, another one about two weeks ago. Um, and But four of them are large enough and bright enough that you could see them even in a small telescope. Now, I, I want to stick close to what you would normally see from your backyard. But if you could see those two little cloud bands, we actually have a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter. It's called Juno, which in legend was Jupiter's wife, actually. And it was launched, um, well, about 10 years ago, almost exactly, August of 2011. And it got to Jupiter in 2016, and it's going around the poles. So instead of around the equator, it's going from North Pole to South Pole. And uh, this is a fairly recent picture, but check out this. Isn't that amazing? Look at the detail there. It looks like I tripped and spilled a whole bunch of really colorful stuff. But you've, each of the little round ovals are like little storm systems in the clouds of Jupiter. Just, just an amazing picture. Is that Jupiter or is that one of the moons? I no, that's Jupiter. That. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's actually the planet Jupiter from the Juno spacecraft. Amazing, just amazing the detail that we're seeing. You won't see this from your backyard, but uh, you can see a couple of the cloud bands. And some say, if you have got binoculars, prop your binoculars or prop your arms, I should say, up on like a fence or the hood of a car, hold them real still. You might be able to see some of the moons close to Jupiter. So check that out. Now, as far as some of the other things in the sky, anybody see the Big Dipper there? I hope. Mm -hmm. You can see our seven familiar stars that make our Big Dipper. And uh, we'll do a little basic astronomy here. If you can find the Dipper, it's in the northeast, or excuse me, northwest now. And uh, if you can find the Dipper, and it, almost, it really looks a lot like a Dipper now, like it's just getting ready to pour, go to the two stars farthest uh, from the handle and draw a line right through them, just like that, and you can find our North Star Polaris. And Polaris is about four fifths high in the northern sky, 40 degrees, and that's our latitude on the Earth. Now, a lot of people think the North Star is the brightest star. Not sure where that comes from. We know it's important. Maybe that equates to brightness, but it's not even in the <laughs> top 30 of bright stars. So it's, it's way down the list. But here's why it's important. If you take your camera and point it at our North Star and just take like a picture for a, an hour, you get something like this. Isn't that cool? And so the stars, as the Earth turns, the stars trail, but look at the North Star. It doesn't move very much at all. That's why it's important. It's like the hub of a great big wheel. As the Earth turns, the other stars look like they're moving, but the North Star always stays in the same spot. That's why the North Star is important. So since you can always find it in the same place, then if you're out camping or something, you always know which way north is, unless you have my luck and it's probably cloudy. Now, if you go back to that Big Dipper, you can still see it there in the northwest. Notice how the handle of the Big Dipper kind of curves a little bit. It's not a straight line. You can follow that curve down to the fourth brightest star in the sky, and it's called Arcturus. It means the guardian of the bear. Now it's part of a kind of like a shepherd in the sky, but don't you think it looks like a kite? I don't see how you get a shepherd out of that, but you know, gotta have a pretty good imagination, I guess. So uh, Arcturus is kind of an orange star too. Stars do come in different colors, but most people don't stop to notice that. So if you're ever out, you know, check it out. If you got a telescope, deliberately turn Arcturus out of focus. So instead of a pinpoint, it looks like a larger sphere and it's, you can see the colors easier that way. So if you think of that curve as an arc, we teach people follow the arc to Arcturus. And then after you find Arcturus, we've moved just a little bit to the Southwest. Arcturus is at the top. You can speed on to a star called Spica, which is actually a bluish star and it's the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, which is supposed to be a princess. Again, I don't know how you see a princess in that, but, uh, but you know, we all should have our prin a princess, right? <laughs> so Arcturus is orange, 
Spica is blue. Hmm. Orange and blue. Interesting. Interesting. Now, again, star colors come from temperatures. So the blue star is a lot hotter than the orange star is. Now, if we take our chart and look very close to straight up, we're going to see three very bright stars there. And if you can read the names, this one is Deneb, this one is Vega, and this one is Altair. And if you get out your laser and you can connect those together, and they make a triangle. You know, even I can see a triangle. So this is called our summer triangle, and uh, which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I, I think a committee came up with that. But it's not a real constellation. There are uh, official constellations. There's 88 official constellations, and we use them worldwide. So an astronomer in Russia can talk to an astronomer in Japan, and we can be talking about the same area of the sky. So the triangle is not a constellation. But especially if you're not at the middle fork and you're looking at a lot of light pollution, um, you can at least find these three, these three stars in the sky. Okay, so there's our uh, triangle. Now, each star is a part of its own constellation. So if you can still see the triangle there, um, Deneb is part of a swan. So uh, the word Deneb means the tail. In fact, there are several stars in the sky that have really long names, but they start out Deneb and something else. So it's the tail of the, and then something else. Well, this star is so bright that they just call it Deneb. And maybe you can see uh, what looks like a cross shape there, kind of a cross on its side. And uh, I amateurs sometimes call this the Northern Cross, but it's supposed to be a swan. And then you've got Vega at the top there. It's the brightest of the three triangle stars. And uh, it's kind of part of a little rectangle that's been kicked over. Or if you've had a math class, it's a parallelogram, I guess. Uh, that's supposed to be a harp. And in the old days, harps were made out of tortoise shells. You kind of hollowed out a, an old tortoise shell, put some strings across it, and it made a pretty neat sound. So this is the lyre or harp of Orpheus. So uh, again, I'd look for the little rectangle there. And then lastly, we've got Altair. And notice how there's a star on either side of Altair. And, uh, and then wings. This is an eagle. So this is uh, one of the cupbearers to the Greek gods on Mount Olympus. And if you've got a good imagination, they might look a little bit like that. So there's our eagle and our swan and our harp. And if you're wondering what's in the middle there, that's a fox. But, Kind of not many bright stars that make up the fox, so we just we'll just stick to uh, stick to those three bright ones. Now this is the kind of sky you might see from the edge of town. If you go out, keep an eye on those three stars now, and if you go out to the middle fork, then you get to see a lot more stars, uh, a lot more stars. If you're just starting out, getting into astronomy, you want to do a little stargazing. I really would start in town get one of those star charts from the planetarium website, or I'm sure you can raid the libraries as, bleh, libraries as well, and uh, learn the brighter stars because you'll get overwhelmed if you just head out to the middle fork just for starters. And if you look carefully, can you see running through the triangle is what looked like some fog there. And this is the Milky Way. The Milky Way from the middle fork is stunning. This is a real picture taken from Middle Fork River Forest Preserve. I wish I could say I took it. I do have some that are close to it, but this is absolutely stunning. And when you're looking at the Milky Way, you're seeing clouds of stars, millions upon millions of stars that our eyes just can't quite see individually. And together they kind of look like this, uh, like this hazy river, so to speak, in the sky. Some said it looks like spilled milk, which is where the word Milky Way comes from. Now, the Milky Way is the thickest part of our galaxy. So think of our galaxy as being like this. It's a huge pinwheel of stars. Or, um, and again, it's about 400, uh, 400, um, 400 million stars, a bunch of stars. 
And notice how they're kind of ranged in these really cool arms. Now, the whole thing is about 100,000 light years across. Now, if you haven't heard the word light year before, um, think of light year is about, in miles, it's six and then put 12 zeros. It's the distance that light travels in one year's time. And this is 100,000 light years. So it'd take light 100,000 years to go all the way across that. Light moves pretty quickly too. And you don't live in the middle. We live kind of two thirds of the way out. In the middle, we think, we think there's a large black hole there and there's also a bar. Now I have to be very careful. When I'm teaching at Parkland, I've got my college students there. Um, I tell them there's a bar at the center of the galaxy and they get really, really excited. It's not that kind of bar, okay? It, it's this bar of stars that's there. So if you can see me, think of this galaxy as being like a dinner plate. And here we're looking at the dinner plate face on. But you can take a dinner plate and turn it on its edge. And the dinner plate is relatively flat. So is the galaxy. Now notice that the galaxy and I have something in common that we both kind of bulge around the middle. And that's what's going on there as well. So all this bright area here, these are all stars. Now, if you can, look at these little dots that are around the edge, right around the middle here. Hang on to the thought of those little dots because I'm going to get back to them in a second. But remember, you live out here. So do a little thought experiment with me here. You live where that arrow is pointing. You live on a planet that's going around a kind of a medium-sized star two-thirds of the way out in the galaxy. So you go out into your backyards and you look up in that direction. You're going to see a few stars. But what if you look in this direction? You can barely see that blue arrow there. Towards the center, you're going to see more stars. That is exactly what we see when you look up into the Milky Way. Okay, so when you're looking up into that Milky Way, you're looking in towards that thicker region. So keep that in mind when you head out into darker skies. So let's go back to our triangle. Can you still see that triangle? Still, can I, I, I'm not going to put the arrows in. Got it? There's no arrows in the real sky. Uh, I don't want you to think that you go out to Middle Fork and expect to see arrows. So um, you got it. You're on your own. But if you can still see the cross shape, and it's right like that. At the end of the cross is kind of a cool star. It's called Albireo, which means the hen's beak. So that's the, that's the beak of our swan. Now, Albireo just looks like a rather nondescript star. And it will look like that in binoculars too. But if you look with the telescope, it's actually a double star. Now, double stars are not all that rare. In fact, uh, the last I heard, like roughly half of the stars in the sky have got buddies. Our sun's kind of an oddball because it doesn't seem to have a companion. The cool thing about this one, though, is look at the colors. Now, it's up to you what colors you think they are. The books usually say one's blue and one's a gold color. And again, it's a difference in surface temperature. But here you've got them right next to each other. So if you got that small telescope, look for Albireo. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Okay, so we'll go back to our triangle. And I want to go up towards, um, let's go up towards Vega. That's the star at the top there. And remember that little rectangle. There's four stars that make a rectangle. We're going to look at the two stars at the base of that uh, rectangle. And we're going to look right smack dab between them. And I'm going to be honest with you. This thing is not real bright. So you might have a little trouble with a small telescope, but the cool thing is it's right between those two stars, so it's pretty easy to find. And I don't know if anybody likes Cheerios, but to me, this thing looks like a little Cheerio. Can you see the donut shape there? And with a, a decent telescope, you can even see the hole in the donut. Now, if you have a Hubble Space Telescope, and by the way, if you do, I'd like to talk to you later, but if you do, it goes from a Cheerio to a Fruit Loop. And what we're seeing here is something called the Ring Nebula. Maybe you can see where Ring comes from. What's happened here, though, is it's unfortunate. A star has reached the end of its lifespan. Now, big stars will explode. They sort of implode first and then blow themselves apart. Stars like our sun are not big enough to explode. So what I always like to say is they kind of sneeze. 
And when they do, they uh, kick off their outer layers. So the star right there in the middle, if you can see my cursor, uh, is, uh, can't see it? That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't believe we can see your cursor, but okay, that's uh, we're following along. We're following along. Yeah, it's not that good looking of a cursor anyway, so it's all right. It's uh, But yeah, there's a star right in the middle of that donut, and that's the one that has thrown off its outer layers. So if you're wondering why does it look like a ring, you can take a balloon and blow it up and hold it up to the light. And because the around the edges are a little thicker from your point of view and it's thinner in the middle, it will almost look like a ring. So it's the same thing is really going on here. So see if you can find the ring nebula. And then we go back to our triangle. Let's go down towards Altair there and towards the end of our eagle, right about in that area of the sky is my favorite star cluster. And I know it's really geeky to have a favorite star cluster. But I just love this thing. It's called the wild duck cluster. And I'm not, positive why it's called that. I did a little research on it once when I was in college. And here's what it looks like. And I'm going to leave it up to you. But some said that uh, if, you've, if you've ever seen ducks fly south for the winter, and I don't think the geese around here fly anywhere, <laughs> but um, they, they're all in my backyard. But they fly in Vs. And if you look carefully, some of the stars, you know, use a little imagination some of them are kind of shaped in Vs. And if you're not buying that, that's all I got. I, I, I can't think of anything else. But uh, but you can see the wild duck cluster. Beautiful star cluster. It looks like a little smudge in binoculars. But uh, you, can, you can see the individual stars with the telescope. I'm going to go back to the triangle, I believe, just one more time. And because if you're thinking, well, I don't have a telescope, um, Number one, I know the Planetarium rents telescopes. I believe they're still doing that. Planetarium opens August 1st, by the way, to the public. So uh, you can give them a call out there and maybe rent a telescope for a night or two. But if you got binoculars, if you can see that triangle, look right smack dab in the middle of that triangle, right about there. Now, if you look carefully, there's probably nothing in the middle of that circle. But in binoculars, it's a cute little star cluster that I like to find. And it looks like an upside down coat hanger. Can you see kind of the coat hanger? There's about 10, 9, 10 stars or so. And uh, it, it's called um, Colander 399. You don't need to know that. Uh, it's also called Brochi's Cluster. But um, this particular one was uh, actually first cataloged by a Persian astronomer named Al Sufi in something like 964 AD. So again, there's a lot of neat history to some of this stuff. So you can go out and see if you can find the upside down coat hanger if you want to. Okay, let's move on. Now on the left here, you can see Vega and there's the harp, which looks like a little parallelogram if you'll let me get away with saying that. And look to the right of it, more in the center of your screen. And we got another constellation. Now, this one doesn't look like too much of anything, but it's supposed to be a, uh, a dude, a very strong dude named Hercules. Now, if you're thinking, how do you get Hercules out of that? That's a great question, especially when I tell you that he's upside down and nobody knows why. So his legs are actually towards the top there. And, uh, and if it looks like one of his, uh, or his legs have bends in it, he is kneeling. He, he actually is kneeling. And the reason I want to show you this is the four stars in the middle there that kind of make a, a rectangle are called the keystone. If you have a stone archway, there's usually a stone at the very top, and it's not a perfect square, but it's, kind of, it's thinner at one end, larger at the other, and they call that the keystone. So that's what you see here. And if we look, there we go. If we look on one side of the keystone, and again, there's nothing that appears in the middle of that circle. You gotta, gotta have a telescope for this. It'll look like a little cotton ball in a pair of binoculars. And it's something called M13. Now on a small telescope, it looks a little like this. So again, it looks a little bigger than a star. It looks like eh, there's some detail there. Kind of tough to see. 
In big telescopes, it looks like that. And what we're actually seeing here is over a half a million stars. Now, it looks like somebody took a shoehorn. Of course, nobody knows what a shoehorn is anymore and jam them really tightly in the center. And that's not quite true. They are closer than the stars that are in our sun's neighborhood, but the, uh, they're still far enough apart that the chances of any two stars colliding is pretty rare. So this is in the shape of a globe. So they call it a globular or a globular star cluster. And there's about oh, 130 of these that we know about in the sky. Now I call this M13. Like, okay, wait a minute, M13, what, is, is that a Star Wars thing? You know, But M13 has to do with this dude. This guy is a French comet hunter, and he lived in the end of the, seven, uh, end of the 1700s. And uh, the king hired him to look for comets because comets were thought to be really bad. And he cataloged a number of things that look like comets, but weren't because comets will move over time. And so he really made a catalog of things to avoid because they're not comets. Well, this is some of the coolest stuff you can find in the sky. It's like 110 objects in uh, this guy's catalog. His name was Chuck Messier, M-E-S-S-I-E-R. He's French. And so you have the Messier catalog. So that globular cluster I showed you is Messier 13 or M13. So they're just a little background. Now, if we keep moving south, from our triangle, you'll run into this large constellation, which I just love to talk about. Um, it's actually a, uh, a doctor holding a snake. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, why would a doctor, what, what's going on with this? Well, first of all, the whole thing is called Ophiuchus, which sounds more like a stomach disorder, but uh, snakes were thought to have medicinal purposes. And since snakes would shed their skin, so it was thought that there was something about snakes that, that maybe had something to do with health. And if you check it out, the American Medical Association has a uh, logo that are still two snakes that are uh, going around a pole. So um, the planets and the sun actually pass through the constellation of Ophiuchus uh, at, during part of the year. So it's really a constellation of the zodiac, but we don't really call it that because, you know, who wants to be in a bar or something and say, you know, what sign are you? I'm an Ophiuchus. It's, it's, a, it's a real turnoff, you know. And I actually think if I looked at the dates, I might actually be an Ophiuchan. But that, that's, that's another story. So, um, so Ophiuchus may have been one of the first doctors. If we go further to the south, we want to talk about these two uh, constellations quickly. The one on the right, there's a bright star, and it's named Antares. And it's very reddish. You'll be able to see this. So again, it's it's still hot. It'll still burn you, but it's much cooler than our sun is. And uh, the name uh, the name Antares has an interesting interesting story behind it. Um, since this is red, it looks a lot like the planet Mars, and uh, so people wanted to distinguish the two. Mars is a Roman name. And the Greek name for Mars is Aries. And if you remember from school, an antonym, it's like, oh my God, high school English. Um, an antonym is opposite. So you have A-N-T and Aries. So it's a very, very bad translation. But in a way, the name Antares means not Mars. So now you know it's, it, it looks like Mars, but no, it's not Mars. And notice there's a star on either side of Antares. And then running down close to the southern horizon, it makes almost a letter J shape. So you want to look for that letter J. In fact, we can each draw it in right there. Now, for those of you that love Disney movies, um, you might remember the Disney movie Moana. And there was a character in that named Maui. And Maui had a fish hook. Well, if you go south of the equator... Polynesia down in Australia, um, they call this Maui's fish hook. It's a lot higher in the sky down there, but you can see Maui's fish hook. Now, behind it is a constellation called Sagittarius. And if I draw them in, Sagittarius is a half man, half beast archer. You can see the bow and arrow there. Now, I don't know how you get a, a half man, half beast out of that, but if I can go backwards here a little bit, 
Look at Sagittarius. Doesn't it look like a teapot? You know, it's kind of got a handle and, and a spout. This is often it reminds called me more of like the Aladdin's lamp. Yes, could be that too. Could be that too. Very good. Yeah. So uh, amateurs often call this the teapot of Sagittarius. Now it's in this part of the sky. There we just went out to the middle fork. Notice the stars and notice the Milky Way. This is where the Milky Way is brightest. Now, if uh, you might see right in the middle of the screen, the Milky Way, it's kind of comes in and then it kind of bulges a little bit, almost not quite circular. If you remember that uh, picture that I showed you and I just put it there kind of as a little inset, that you're looking right towards the center. And I put the little plus sign there. That's approximately where the center of the galaxy is. So when you're looking towards that spout of the teapot or the uh, where the genie comes out of Aladdin's lamp for Jennifer, <laughs> then that you're looking pretty close to the to the center of the Milky Way. So I want you to look at the tail of the scorpion and the spout of that teapot right there, because there's a couple of cool things you can see with binoculars right off the edge of the scorpion's tail are two uh, star clusters. Uh, and unlike the one that's in, the sh in a globe, you can actually count the stars in these. They're called open clusters. And there's some Messier numbers. There's M6 and M7. Above the teapot's spout are two glowing clouds of gas that we call nebula. And this is M8 and M20. M20 is called the Triffid Nebula, which has the distinction of being uh, one of the few sky objects that ever appeared in the original Star Trek. There's some trivia for you. And, uh, and M8 is called the Lagoon Nebula. Now, a word about these pictures. Um, film and now digital photography are much, much better at picking up color. You're not gonna see the colors with your eyes. In fact, if you look at M8, uh, look carefully, you can see a little star cluster in the middle of that, some white dots. You can see the star cluster pretty easy. You got to collect a lot of light, have a bigger telescope if you want to see some of the gas around there. So, um, but this is this is the Milky Way. And if you go out where it's very, very dark, um, I took this on a mountain, uh, kind of on the top of a mountain. Um, by the way, the, the dark cloud there, that's actually a cloud, but uh, the bright stuff behind are all star clouds. This is an untouched photograph, and you can see the star clouds of the Milky Way right there. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. And then if we come back home and look towards the east, there's that diamond of Pegasus uh, rising up behind our observatory. And just to the left or north of it is the W shape of Cassiopeia. And I know we're all having fun in the summer, but just know that Pegasus is kind of a fall constellation. So they're, they're, they're getting closer, okay? Now, if you're out looking, I want you to look very carefully at this. You see anything moving? See a dot right there? If you can, a lot of people ask about this. It's gonna repeat itself here. That's the space station. A space station can be quite bright. It can be as bright as Venus out there and people see it and there's no, if there's a red flashing light on it, it's not the space station. But if you want to know when you can find the space station, there's a website, heavens-above, make sure you get the dash in there, .com. And uh, you put in your uh, location and tell them, hey, I live in Champaign or Banner or wherever you're, wherever you're watching from. And it'll tell you when you can see the space station. So the space station is about 260 miles up there, but it has these large solar panels that reflect the sun's light and 16 of them actually. And the space station can be quite bright. Now we're winding down here, but I wanna mention some coming attractions and Jennifer actually already mentioned one of these, but uh, throughout the year, we've got about a dozen or so meteor showers. Now you can see a shooting star or a meteor about any night of the year. You just have to be lucky. I wish I could tell you like, yeah, at, at you know, 9.01 tonight, but I, I can't tell you that. It, they're little bits of dust, the size of a pencil eraser. And when they come through the atmosphere, they slow down. You know, just think about, 
I use a demonstration of throwing a thumbtack into water. It'll still fall, but it'll slow down. And when it does so, its energy is transferred to the air and you're actually seeing the air glowing. And, uh, and you can see one about any night. But when the earth goes through a cloud of this dust, that's when you see more of it. And for the Perseids, you can see the date there. That's the maximum. The night of the 11th into the morning of the 12th. Uh, this is one of two major meteor showers in the year. The other one's in December. Most people don't like to be outside then. So at maximum, you see an average of two a minute. Now, when I say average, you might go five minutes without seeing one, but then you might see four or five all at once. So what, I, excuse me, average is about two a minute. The cool thing about meteor showers is the equipment. You don't need any. All you really need is a lawn chair. You want something that's very comfy. That dude looks comfy. And so you can face, and don't face a direction, face up. That's, yeah, the meteors will look like they're coming out of the, out of the east, but if you face the east, you're going to miss all the ones that are overhead. So make sure that you see that. There's no equipment. And um, we, as Jennifer said, we're going to do something out at the Middle Fork at the Sugar Creek area on August 11th. And I'm going to be there um, if the skies are clear. Let's hope the skies are clear. At uh, 8.30, we're going to do a little talk. Um, we're not going to have any pictures, but uh, I'll have my laser. We'll do a little demonstration on what we're actually seeing. And then we're just going to sit. We're going to sit out and see what we can see. And uh, what's happened here and why we're seeing this has to do with comets. So this is a comet, and uh, we won't get into a lot about comets, but comets are like um, the, the snowballs you roll up in the wintertime that have leaves and dog droppings and all that other stuff in it. And I don't think there's dog droppings in space, but lots of dust. And as the dust, uh, as the comet goes around the sun, it leaves this trail of dust. You remember Hansel and Gretel, you know, leaving the trail of breadcrumbs? That's kind of what comets do. And if the Earth comes around and smacks into this dust trail, then that's when we might be able to see some of these things burning up in the sky. So here, here's just a few of them here. And some of them can get quite bright where they actually light up the ground. Those are the cool ones that, uh, that, we, that we really want to see. So I don't know what we'll see, but we'll look forward to that. Now for your calendars, way in the future, but it's good to start planning now, on April 8th of 2024, I know that's a long way away. You know, let's get through the pandemic first. But we've got another solar eclipse coming. Now, in 2017, hopefully, a lot of you got to see the eclipse as it went from west to east across our country. And it went through southern Illinois. We were down in southern Illinois and, uh, and got to see that. Well, on 2024, notice that we have one and it's going through southern Illinois again. So on that particular day, if you can see this, there's the path, there's the whole shadow. The, the main part of the shadow is that black dot though. So if you're in any of the other part of that shadow, you're seeing a partial eclipse. You wanna be right along that line and it goes through a lot of major cities. And I mean, if you look at this, Austin, Dallas, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Rochester, Montreal, and all parts in between. If we zoom in here a little closer, and I don't know how well you can see this. This is Southern Illinois. St. Louis is to the uh, upper left. So it's going right through Carbondale again. Somebody's a Saluki fan. I don't, I don't get it. So um, uh, Carbondale is good. It's going right over the top of Vincennes. If you're anywhere between those two red lines, though, you get to see it. Now, Champaign-Urbana is not on there, but Champaign is circled. And uh, here you, there's Indianapolis to the right. And again, it's like from Effingham to Paris. You have to be south of an Effingham to Paris line. And I'll give you a little bit of a heads up. If you want to hang out with the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society, we're going to go to Olney, Illinois. Uh, there's a spot there. We actually went down and talked to the mayor. And he gave us, put, we got in his truck. He gave us a tour. And there's some athletic fields down there with a lot of space. So that's where we're going to set up. It's not near as far as Southern Illinois, and hopefully won't run into as much traffic down there too. So given that and the time, um, I'd like to thank you for uh, tonight. Really appreciate it. And um, 
Jennifer, I don't know if you were holding the questions or we didn't get any or. Yeah, thank you, Dave. So we didn't have a lot of questions coming through. There was at one point a question that someone had asking if we were looking at the sunset at one point. And I'm not sure if that was something that kind of got answered as you continued to talk and you were able to see. I think that's when you started to talk about the looking at the Milky Way, Milky Way from different angles and whatnot like that. But if you do have any questions, if you're still with us, please enter them into the comments and we will answer them. If you are watching this later after our live viewing, you could still enter your questions into the comments and we will see them and answer them later. Oh, okay, so someone is asking again about what day is the viewing? Yes, so August 11th, that's a Wednesday, correct? Yes. I believe so, Wednesday night. It is yeah. a Wednesday night. We are going to be at Middle Fork River Forest Preserve in Penfield. So if you live in Champaign, it is a little bit of a drive, but it's the darkest place and the best place to see the stars. So it's worth it. And we will be there starting at 830. We are going to gather around the Sugar Creek Shelter, which is right by the Activity Center, which is the big building there, um, the enclosed building. We won't be there. We'll be in the shelter kind of behind it. And we're going to do, Dave is going to be there to do a little sky talk, like what we just did tonight, but actually looking at stars uh, at the beginning at 830. So if you want to be there for the talk, if the skies are clear, we will be there at 830. Otherwise, you can come anytime during the night to view the meteor shower. Um, we probably will not be there until peak activity, which is like 2 a.m., but the, the, you are welcome to view in the preserve um, any time in the night. And now when I say peak activity, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Dave, now we can see meteors as soon as it starts to get dark on that night and on the night of the 12th too, right? And kind of even mm -hmm. the day before that. Um, but the peak activity, when you're gonna see the most meteors coming through uh, your field of vision is gonna be right around 2 a.m. on August 12th, which is the evening of Wednesday the 11th, right? Yeah, and, and the reason for that is, this may be difficult to see, but um, if I, I've got our, a globe here, before midnight, it, let's just say the Earth is, uh, well, I'm trying to figure out my orientation here. Well, I'll just say before midnight, um, you're on the side of the Earth where any meteors you see have to catch up with the Earth. But after midnight, you're on the side facing right into the meteor stream. Almost think about driving in a car and you run into a little uh, swarm of mosquitoes. Okay, most of them are going to be on the front windshield. Now, if there's any uh, mosquitoes that are traveling faster than your car, they could smack into the back windshield. That'd be really strange, but it could happen. So after midnight, you're on the front windshield, kind of facing into the meteor stream. So that's no, the numbers typically pick up uh, after midnight. It do doesn't mean they will, but that typically they do. Yes. And, you know, for those of you who are not able to make it out to the Middle Fork, you don't have to be there to see it. Is it possible to see it in Champaign? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's just since you're not mm -hmm. seeing a lot of the fainter stars, it's the same with the meteors. So yeah. we're at the Middle Fork, and I'm making up these numbers. Let's say we see 60 meteors. Well, of those, you might see 20 in town mm -hmm. that, right. that are bright enough. So you can go to, you know, an area outside the edge of town and kind of watch from there if you are not able to make it all the way out to the Middle Fork. And just so I mentioned this, the program is free, the August 11th program. You do not have to register or sign up or anything like that. You just show up and bring a chair and your bug spray. Um, <laughs> <And> bug spray. <laughs> bring your bug spray. And as long as skies are clear, we will be there. Now, if the skies are cloudy and we have to cancel our talk, we're going to post that information on our Facebook page. And we'll also have the information recorded on the 
phone line. So if you go to the Homer Lake Interpretive Center or the Champaign County Forest Preserve District Facebook page, you can find all of the event details for this event that we're talking about. And you can see there's a number that we have listed that you can call. If the program has to be canceled, we're going to record a message on that number that says it's canceled. Um, but if skies are clear, we will be there. And now that you know so much about what stars and planets and whatnot you can see, you can visit any of the preserves anywhere outside that it's dark and see what you can find at any time. It doesn't have to be during the meteor shower. You can go at your leisure. And Dave mentioned some really great resources on the planetarium's website. Definitely recommend checking those out um, because there are the star charts and whatnot. Now someone asked a question about where can they find details about the Perseid viewing not on Facebook. Uh, it should be on our CCFPD website as well. I believe it is on our website. If it is not, uh, we will make sure that it gets on that calendar. But it will be there and uh, we will, let's see, make sure that the info gets on there. So that would be ccfpd.org. And that would be somewhere that anybody can go and you can go to our events calendar and you should be able to see the information. If it's not on there now, we'll make sure that it gets on there soon. And we'll have the phone number on there too that you can call if the program has to be canceled. But yeah, thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much to Dave. It's always a joy hearing you talk about the stars and the night sky and your experiences. And we can't wait until we're able to do a, an observing session in person with the rest of the Astronomical Society. Or, you know, if you can't wait until the Forest Preserve has one, you can head out to the planetarium. Very so, true. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we will wrap it up there. Again, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. If you have any questions coming in, please um, leave those in the comments and we will get back to them uh, as we can. But thank you again for watching everybody and have a good night. Thanks everybody. Good night.